All right, it's time to talk about my personal top 10 favorite horror movies of 1973. And if you haven't checked out my other videos, I'll leave the link right here above for my rankings of 1974 all the way up to the 80s. Oh, I did all the 80s, and now I'm almost done with the 70s. Just got 70 to 72 left. So let's talk about 1973 in this video. And I'm not just going to do top 10. I'm also giving you a few honorable mentions and a few dishonorable mentions. This year, I was not very familiar with going into this ranking. I had only seen maybe three or four movies, and now I've seen officially 49, and one of those movies was three hours long. Let's jump right into the dishonorable mentions, with the first one being The Massage Parlor Murders, a sleazy mystery horror film that started off silly and looked like it was going to be cheesy and fun, but it got worse and worse by the end. This film is so poorly paced, written, and directed, it's just absolute dreck. It has terrible editing decisions, lack of coverage, random insert shots, and just horrible cinematography. There's muffled dialogue, there's missing sound effects, and just poor foley work. They waste so much time at this naked pool party, you swear the scene goes on for 10 minutes with nothing but shot after shot of people swimming naked and waste so much time building this relationship between the cop and this masseuse who's the chick from last house on the left and it just goes nowhere the kills could have been way more effective if the effects were good and the whole investigation is really just pointless because the person who takes down the killer is the masseuse in the open and we don't even know who this guy is once he's revealed. He's just like a Mrs. Voorhees, so why were they hiding his identity the entire film? So there's no good mystery here. The second dishonorable mention will go to The Werewolf of Washington, one of the worst werewolf comedy horror movies of all time that makes American Werewolf in Paris look like an Oscar picture. This is supposed to be like a comedy horror, but it does not succeed at being either comedy or horror. The transformation sequence is just horrible. It's the poorly edited, like, time-lapse transitions going from one stage of makeup to the next. And this wolf can't seem to decide if it wants to walk on all fours or two legs like a human. The dialogue is mostly dull, and the humor just doesn't work. Every joke just falls flat. You got a bunch of characters that are just painfully dumb, and no one is likable. This movie has, like, hardly any blood, no gore, and they have a character say, this woman had her guts ripped out, and then they hard cut to her body with, like, a little blood on her neck, and her stomach is perfectly fine and intact. Last dishonorable mention, the worst movie I watched this month will be Carnival of Blood, which is 80 long, excruciating minutes of inept filmmaking made by people who never worked again, thank Christ. The rating this movie has is absurd, and obviously it's just a bunch of fake reviews from the people who made this movie and their relatives. This movie has piss poor acting, lingering shots, zero coverage, and bad edits, garbage cinematography, out of focus shots, poor framing, it's just so inept. The story is asinine, mixing like vampire and zombie genres together in one diary of filled toilet of a film. My balls could write a better script than this. You got cliche characters, a transvestite fortune teller, and a guy who only refers to his wife as Mrs. N. You can just tell that they went to some abandoned carnival that one of their parents owned and filmed there at nights, and it's just such a horrible movie that I actually flipped off my TV when it was over. All right, now let's get into my top 10. Starting at number 10 is The Severed Arm. It's a revenge horror movie with a reveal you see coming a mile away, but has a few gory aftermath arms severed with a hatchet. This is about a group of friends who get trapped in a cave and then they resort to cannibalism, eating one of the guy's arms moments before rescue comes. Then it flashes forward a few years later, and one by one, the survivors are getting their arms chopped off, and they think it's the guy whose arm they ate that's coming back for revenge. But is it? The acting is serviceable. Uh, I liked the DJ character who was the priest in Fangs. Uh, I wasn't big on the music. It was a bit jarring. It sounded like it would fit better in a sci-fi picture. You got like a Black Christmas moment in the movie at a radio station. It's well-paced, you got some good old-fashioned revenge, and I like the ending, 
but just wish the final shot wasn't so weird. Number nine will go to an anthology movie called The Vault of Horror. This is an amicus anthology with five short stories about greed for the most part. Each story is pretty quick to the point and different from the last, each having like a different subgenre. There's a vampire segment with a dark, humorous ending. You got a voodoo segment with paintings of portraits that are linked to people and whatever he does to the painting happens to the actual person. So you got some kind of graphic kills in that one, but nothing ultra gory. There's an insurance fraud segment that's a bit claustrophobic feeling, and but just doesn't really have quite the payoff you would want. There's an egotistical homicidal magician segment with killer rope that should have ended with that guy being hung outside the hotel. Then there's a segment about a guy who's very OCD, he's a bit of a neat freak, but Unlike all the other segments, this guy in this one is not greedy or homicidal. He's just a victim, but I like the ending. It was pretty clever. The wraparound has like a little twist at the end that you, you see coming. This movie, honestly, it doesn't need a wraparound, but it has a good production value, some solid performances, an old school soundtrack, and is definitely better, in my opinion, than Asylum, which is overrated. Number eight, here comes the hate, is The Exorcist. This is a movie that I want to love, but it's too damn slow moving for me, and I think part three is superior. This is one of the rare cases where I can actually say I prefer the book over the movie. The flashes of Pazuzu on the screen throughout the movie, they seem to do it like three or four times at least. I'm not a big fan of it, and I wish they would have played that Tubular Bells theme more often in the movie, or at least some kind of variation of it. Hands down, I think the soundtrack and sound design of the movie are the best aspects of it. Everything involving possessed Reagan, her yelling blasphemous vulgar things, spinning her head, all that stuff is fantastic. I just wish there was more of it in the movie. I feel like too much time is spent on Karis and the detective Kinnerman. There's just scenes between them and scenes between Kinnerman and uh, Reagan's mom that are just way too dialogue heavy, way more dialogue heavy than they need to be. I also just don't find this movie all that scary. And when you have a tagline that says the scariest movie ever made, you should try to live up to that. To me, this movie is unintentionally funny, especially when you see a bunch of doctors in the room smoking together and your mother sucks cocks in hell. Like, how can you not laugh at that? So... To me, it's more of a comedy, and I feel like the only version of this film I've seen is the director's cut, which I think is much longer than the theatrical, so maybe if I watch that version, I'll enjoy it more, who knows. But I've seen this movie over half a dozen times. I still don't love it, but I like it. And shout out to the horror master who chose this as his favorite. Number seven goes to a very bizarre movie called The Baby. This is an interesting weird story with a great lead character and an unexpected twist. The performances are really good and I like the third act pretty gripping and went in a direction I did not anticipate. There's some really messed up disturbing scenes with sexual and physical abuse of a grown man with the mind of an infant. The runtime is pretty short, moves along pretty good, and the guy who plays the baby legit sounds like a baby. I wonder if they used actual baby noises like dubbing over him or if he actually made those sounds himself. It was pretty convincing. The end twist really got me and I'm just glad this movie didn't turn into like a courtroom drama instead. And shout out to Paul B who chose this as his favorite. Number six will go to Sergio Martino's Torso. A super sleazy giallo filled with beautiful ladies, gratuitous nudity, and lesbian sex. If you want to see a bunch of tits and sex, this is the movie for you. This is probably one of the most sleaziest films I've ever seen. The writing of this film is a bit absurd, like the whole scarf color pattern plot point. That tw The twist with that is laughably ridiculous. It's well shot though. They use a lot of beautiful locations in Italy, and the Italian soundtrack is quite catchy. I thought the third act was quite suspenseful with our final girl stuck in this secluded house on top of the hill, injured, all alone. I thought the atmosphere was terrific. You get a bit of gore, not a whole lot, but you do see some like quick shots of eye gouging and limbs being sawed off. 
The killer isn't so predictable, which I always like. I usually can predict who the killer is, but this is not the case in this one. There, there's quite a few red herrings, and I think this is easily Sergio Martino's best giallo, in my opinion. And shout out to Mikey, Jeanette Spivak, and Teal Martin, who chose this as their favorites. Number five is a movie that was quite a surprise to me. I was not expecting to like it so much, and that is The Night Strangler. This is a horror mystery by Dan Curtis with a lead actor who is absolutely fantastic and hilarious. There's some good humor and quirky characters that really just help keep you engaged with the story. I really like the atmosphere and the Seattle locations were wonderful. The underground area and the score was terrific. I thought the story was well written and intriguing and went in a direction that I didn't expect. The back and forth dialogue between Kojak and his boss and the other cops who hate Kojak is very entertaining. Kojak is just such a great character. He carries this film. He had, I just love his wit and attitude towards other authority. Just doesn't give a shit and just keeps doing his own thing. I just wish the strangulation scenes in this movie were more brutal on screen, less one note. Like It's just the same kill sequence again and again someone looking towards the camera and then it just kind of cuts away and they're dead. This movie has the typical like James Bond villain speech at the end or like a scream movie like let me tell you everything I'm doing before I kill you scenario which is definitely forced in this but it's to be expected in a lot of movies. It's a super enjoyable murder mystery that is a bit of a hidden gem and a sequel. Number four goes to a Romero film that I did not like on first watch, but this time I really enjoyed it, and that is The Crazies. This is a dark, disturbing, accurate look at society and human behavior during an epidemic. I thought the open scene was great, very disturbing, and the whole first act is just super fast-paced. The Crazies do some pretty fucked up, unsettling, unspeakable things in this film to their own family members, and I thought all the characters, for the most part, were pretty likable. There's a good amount of action sequences and a bit of humor sprinkled in with like the crazy woman sweeping the field of dead soldiers. I wish they didn't spend so much time with the army side of the story. I feel like some of those scenes are a little overextended. They, they kind of slow down the pace of the movie and they could have gotten to the point quicker. The ending does feel a bit abrupt, a little unfinished. I wish that, like the remake, they would have had that nuke go off that they keep mentioning. But I think this movie ran out of money and that's probably the reason why. Number three will go to a haunted house movie called The Legend of Hell House. To me, this is John Hughes' best movie, and it is a haunted mansion investigation movie with Roddy McDowell and has terrific acting. Two things make this movie fantastic. One, the characters, I think, are all great, and the atmosphere of this at uh, mansion is spooky and awesome. It's very well shot with some fantastic cinematography. I think the cat sequence is pretty silly kind of reanimator-like, and there's some effective jump scares. It's a bit leisurely paced, but it's never really dull or boring. The twist reveal in this movie isn't really all that mind-blowing. The climax could have been a little bit more exciting, and there could have been one more kill. Number two will go to probably my new favorite Vincent Price movie, and that is Theater of Blood. An entertaining, silly revenge movie with Vincent Price giving a very theatrical and captivating performance. The premise has some similarities to another Vincent Price movie that came out the following year, Madhouse, but in this movie, the kills mirror those of kills in Shakespeare stories. And the kills are kind of gory for the time. You see hearts being ripped out of chests, people getting stabbed. Uh, heads being sawed off, and even puppies get killed. There's a twist reveal of who one person is who's obviously wearing a disguise. Like, there's a reveal like, oh my gosh, that person was actually this person. I was like, no shit. Like, that was obvious from the beginning. And there was a very, like, unnecessary, like, flashback scene, like, sh telling us how someone survived one scene is like, well, we didn't really need all that information. Once you get to the end, you see where it's going. You can predict how it's going to wrap up, unfortunately. But 
it was still pretty enjoyable. Uh, I don't understand one character's betrayal, but like I said, it's still enjoyable. It's a lot of fun, and it's mostly due to Vincent Price and the kills. Before we get to my number one, let's go over three honorable mentions that barely missed the list, starting with The Corruption of Chris Miller. For me, this is a too-long-for-its-own-good murder mystery thriller with a sexually abusive stepmom and a hard-to-follow narrative. I felt the ultimate reveal of like who the killer was in the opening scene and who did the slayings at the farmhouse nearby, like that reveal was a bit disappointing and felt loosely connected to the main storyline. I liked Barney, the main lead male protagonist. He was really the only likable character. The ending is not exactly what I would have wanted and leaves me with some questions. Uh, maybe this is a movie that requires a couple viewings to fully understand. I do think the second act could have used more horror, less drama, could have been trimmed down. There is a long gap between that opening kill and the farmhouse slaying. It's well shot and the story is interesting enough to keep you hooked and watching, but it just needed more in the middle in terms of horror. Less drama and romance. Second honorable mention will go to a movie called Horror High, aka Kiss the T-Shirt Goodbye. It's a Toxic Avenger meets Slaughter High revenge horror movie set at a high school where the lights are always off and no one ever tries to turn them on. What this movie needs is a better transfer, more kills, and better effects. Vernon's transformation into a monster should have been on screen, and he should have looked more monstrous. But I like Vernon, his character. He's relatable, sympathetic, bit of a pushover. You know, he's the bullied kid, and I, I like his relationship with Robin. The teachers are really extreme in how mean they are to this kid, and... It has the cop from Assault on Precinct 13. Uh, the pacing is good, but the lighting is just too dark at times. The score is very, like, of the time, 70s, like, disco upbeat, and it just should have been more dramatic and suspenseful. I do think they could have developed Vernon's character a little bit more by showing his home life. We never see his parents and what's going on at home. I feel like they could have explored that side of the character also. And every kid in this movie at this high school looks like they're 30. Last honorable mention will go to a Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee film, and that is The Creeping Flesh. This is a Cushing and Lee starring sci-fi horror period piece with good atmosphere and a somewhat intriguing plot. It's a well-acted and produced film with a twist at the end that kind of leaves it up for interpretation a bit. I kind of like the look of the monster, but I do think it could have looked cooler and we could have seen it do more evil things, have an extra couple of kills thrown in here. The writing does seem a bit silly at times, like some of the dialogue feels pretty forced, but the pacing was okay and I thought Peter Cushing stole the show. All right, number one, first time watch a movie that I did not expect to love, but I did, and that is The Wicker Man. This is an unsettling and disturbing cult movie that feels like a musical at times and stars Christopher Lee, who wears many funny-looking wigs. I usually don't like musicals, but when the people singing and dancing are gorgeous naked ladies, I can tolerate it. The setting is great. I like the trapped, isolated, on an island, away from a normal society feel that it creates. And the performance by the lead actor, uh, Edward Woodward, I think is his name, uh, I thought he was just wonderful. I love the ending. I thought it was just so like upsetting in a good way and really creepy. I love the dialogue, the fish out of water premise. You feel just as baffled and confused as the lead character as he journeys around this island looking for this missing girl. He witnesses and overhears a lot of unusual things that are just jaw-dropping weird and make you laugh uncomfortably. The movie does move at a good pace. I just wish the opening credits weren't so damn long. That's the only slow moment in the movie. It lists, like, every possible crew member. Like, the only person that was left out was the craft service team. I did see the twist coming with the Rowan girl that he's going there to look for. Thought that was a bit obvious, but still an engaging, bizarre story with a great lead character who unfortunately puts himself in a deadly, terrifying situation. All right, so that's the end of my top 10, but before I go, I'll give you some other honorable mentions. Just shout out a few films that are worth checking out from the year 1973. So let's start with The Killing Kind. 
Young Terry Lambert returns home from serving a prison term for a gang rape he was forced to participate in. He then seeks revenge on his lawyer and the girl who framed him. But his real problem is his overbearing mother. The Invasion of Carol Anders After her murder, Diana Bernard sends her spirit to get trapped in Carol Anders so she can expose Diana's killer. Don't Look in the Basement a young psychiatric nurse goes to work at a lonesome asylum following a murder. There, she experiences varying degrees of torment from the patients. Horror Hospital Following his forced retirement from an appalling rock band, Jason decides to vacation at Brittle House Manor, a health farm run by the leather-gloved ex-Nazi scientist Dr. Storm. Dark Places a scheming couple plot to conceal a hidden cache of stolen money from its rightful owner. The only problem is that the house they plan to hide it in is haunted. Horror rises from the tomb. In medieval France, a warlock is beheaded and his wife tortured and executed. Hundreds of years later, an isolated group of people discover his head buried on their property. Soon it comes back to life possessing people and using them to commit sacrifices and to search for the rest of his body. Psychomania. A gang of young people call themselves the living dead. After an agreement with the devil, if they kill themselves firmly believing in it, they will survive and gain internal life. Attack of the Blind Dead. 500 years after they were blinded and executed for committing human sacrifices, a band of Templar knights returns from the grave to terrorize a rural Portuguese village. Lisa and the Devil. When Lisa gets lost, she finds an old mansion in which to shelter. Soon, she is sucked into a vortex of deception, debauchery, and evil. And lastly, don't look now. Laura and John, grieved by a terrible loss, meet in Venice, where John is in charge of the restoration of a church, two mysterious sisters, one of whom gives them a message sent from the afterlife. So there you have it. That is the end of my top 10 of 1973. What is your top 10? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, if you like what you've seen here, you can hit this like button and become a subscriber today just by clicking on my cartoon face in about five seconds. And remember, it's all opinion. You don't need to get butthurt about it. <laughs>